Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, for coming along to this talk. Um, my name is Donald Carlin. I'm a second year PhD student in Queens. Um, my journey towards kind of cybersecurity um, started fairly recently. Um, I spent 20 years managing and working in some of the uh, most famous bars in Belfast, um, having been made redundant one Friday afternoon, and then finding out that I was going to be a dad for the second time 24 hours later. I decided to. Uh, get my act together and get a, a proper job. So always um, interested in computers from my um, first Spectrum, 48K when I was three, programming stuff in BASIC, um, but no qualifications in computers. I decided to join Queens and do the MSc in software development, which converts a primary degree into software development. Um, for the dissertation then, I asked um, someone in CSIP to set me a project, which was dynamic analysis of malware. And, and then from there, I, I joined and decided to do a PhD. So I'm relatively new to the cybersecurity industry. Um, my talk should be in three parts. So there should be a live demo in the background. This is my first time presenting this outside Queens or presenting anything outside Queens. So whenever I say to people that I'm going to do a live demo, we kind of go, what? Um, hopefully it'll work. Then I'll talk about the data set that um, I've built and I'm currently building, and then the future work that we'll use for that, OK? So, um, the, the, essentially, to build the data set, I used a lot of different kind of tools that I then cobbled together in um, a bit of a symbolic fashion to make an end-to-end -end kind of run system. So essentially, we take a file, um, assess it against, we virtualize it, use dynamic analysis, and then assess it against a machine learning model that we've built on our data set, OK? Um, called ARC, just as a random acronym, but also my uh, boys called NOAA. So I said I would name the first thing after NOAA, NOAA's ARC. Um, so I'll try and get out of this. Um, not only is it a live demo or my first outside Queens presentation, but I have to RDP into Queens to get it running. And then from Queens, RDP into our malware lab to then get that running. So hopefully this works. Yeah, okay. So essentially I'm just going to set this running and then go on with the presentation and we'll look at the results at the end. So just a simple shell script executes a Python script, and then that's that's the malware virtualized in there, okay? So. So, um, the kind of context of my PhD then is um, just a, a new ways to detect malware. So signature detection is the most widely used approach within commercial malware detection. So as everybody knows, new malware instances must be captured, analyzed for signature, stored, and then deployed. So by definition, you're behind the curve. You have to have a new sample of malware, take it, analyze it, normally manually for a signature, then deploy that to all your users. Obfuscation techniques compound this issue, so um, standard obfuscation techniques, polymorphism, etc., um, can compound this issue. And with recent advances in malware sophistication, some researchers, some researchers have shown that signature-based detection methods are on the brink of failure. Then with the advent of cloud computing, as well as cloud storage, then that's just another attack vector. So the motivation of the research is to develop a strategy for the detection of malware that's immune to modern obfuscation methods and applicable at a hypervisor level. So what we do is opcode analysis. So opcodes, if you don't know, it's portmanteau of operation code. So it's the portion of assembly language that specifies the operation to be performed on our brand. So essentially, the human readable version of machine language. So here we have some here. So there's a yellow highlight bit. Um, so the body of current research, opcode analysis can discriminate between malware and benign software. That's clear from research. This bypasses some issues inherent in signature detection models because you're actually um, examining the code. However, statically analyzed files can't generally investigate packed or partly encrypted malware. Sometimes they can, and they're prone to code obfuscation, so junk insertion, etc. Dynamic analysis, on the other hand, allows obfuscated malware to reveal itself at runtime. You get what should be the true code. However, the data sets used in the literature are small sometimes as small as 70 samples. It kind of doesn't quite stack up that um, in the nice, nicely worded introduction to a research paper, they say there are 40 million samples in the malware zoo. Um, there are you know, new samples every day. And then they go under their methodology and say, so we took 90 samples and ran machine learning on it. It doesn't quite stack up. 
Virtualization for dynamic analysis tends to be virtualized, um, but it can be detected by modern malware. So in terms of my uh, investigation structure, um, I'm at the point of kind of the data set. So I kind of, I've generally critiqued the data sets that um, dynamic analysis investigations have used for being too small, too badly sampled. So we want to try and improve, improve classification. So that's the discrimination between benign software and malicious software. And then by that, we want to investigate malware types and look at uninvestigated malware types and how that feeds back into each, uh, each segment. So the aim is to create a data set of processed instances of malware and goodware, which is sufficiently deep in terms of quantities of samples, sufficiently broad as in types of malware. And the, uh, the purpose of that is to increase classification rates, so discrimination between benign software and malicious, to enable more complex machine and deep learning, so algorithms that need a lot more samples, and to increase understanding of malware types, so that's malware versus malware. So, Building the data set then, um, we, we have a few sources of malware, two of them, Virushare and Malicia. Malicia was from um, a project that ended up doing a very, very good paper. Um, we gave 12,000 binaries that were um, uh, taking basically put 300 um, VMs, um, vulnerable VMs, faced on the internet, pointed them to a couple of URLs and watched as all the malware flew in. So we, ha we had all these samples um, with the MD5 lists as well. Um, so we put those through um, a virus total scanner. So virus total uh, very graciously donated um, a private key um, for a while to allow us to do a lot more um, samples per minute. Um, so we checked the MB5 of each file. Um, we then pulled down the information that we wanted and built a database with it. We then, so for me, I, I look at executable files. Um, the problem being that we had, I think it was 2.3 million files. We didn't know all we had was the MD5 and no extension no idea what this, this file actually was. So rather than picking randomly to try and execute it, we needed some attributes. So essentially this built an attribute database. And for my research, it copied executables into separate folders from a practical sense, but we didn't discard anything else. So the database kind of looks like this. So you have the MD5, you have a response code, which is just an internal check for me to uh, make sure that it exists so that the Python doesn't fall over. Um, the number of positives is in the number of malware scanners that detected it as malware, which I'll explain in a wee minute. The file type and the type of file, which are two different things. Um, and then the results of 52 IV scanners. So essentially we build it like a large descriptive attribute database. Um, one of the problems, uh, it was fairly obvious and it's kind of pervasive, is how do you categorize malware into families? Um, my future investigations will be delineated by malware type. So how do we correctly, if there is a correctly, a correct way of doing it, assign these samples into categories? Um, do we impose our own categorization or clustering? Do we use existing broad measurement tools? And the problem is you have to start from somewhere. So for example, this is one file, um, if you can read that. So at the top there's the MD5. And these are the results of some of the AV scanners. Some of them are reasonably helpful. You see a lot of the word Trojan there a lot. Some are a little bit less, less helpful. There's one that says suspicious. So it's designated the file as suspicious with no real more information than that. So what I did was set the threshold for detection at 50% of AV scanners. So if 27 out of 54 detected it as malware, I took it. That is a talking point about the research, um, which I can discuss later. But essentially, I wanted to kind of set it at a kind of a good immediate, intermediate level. The results weren't in uniform format, so we had to try and find some way of kind of saying, well, what do they all judge them by? There's the Caro 1991 format that you should adhere to, and it was updated later on, but they generally don't. The only thing that you really know is that all components, um, so the family, the type, the variant, are uh, delineated by punctuation. So essentially what we did was we tokenized it and parsed it on majority rules classification. So when you scan through that, the word that appears most is Trojan. So we designated it as Trojan. But it's a tentative label, which kind of underpins the problem. So one of the questions I was asked when I presented this internally in Queens is, why are you spending so much time, as in the first year of your PhD, um, processing the malware into a descriptive database? That's not actually the data that you're capturing. That's just a description of the data that you hope to run. The problem being, as I described, the malware samples were named as MD5, no extensions, so no idea what they were. So it's necessary to divide the data set into the files of interest. For me, they're executables. But all the people, fairly big research center, so all the people are, um, may need a data set of other file types. So sharing the data, um, this was easily done when all the information was stored. So if somebody wants some poison PDFs, we've got a big collection of poison PDFs. There's JavaScript, HTML, 
whatever you want. There, there's a big um, Android research cluster as well, so um, there, there's a lot of Android so, uh, malware available. The emphasis for the new data set was on structure and volume, so they require that information. So as a general life cycle of the malware sample, so first of all, it's downloaded, and then we attribute it. So the, again, these are tentative labels, but it's, it's a starting point. So then we get to the fun bit where we execute it. So we used VirtualBox for virtualization. Um, the API is particularly nice. We used some hardening strategies, um, but not all hardening strategies, which I'll kind of talk about in a minute. So the guest OS was Windows 10, and we staged it to provide a similar environment to the normal user. So kind of like if you're doing a honeypot or a honey net, we have to try and stage it to look like a, a, um, an actual system rather than a faked system. So some kind of hints that I picked up from various talks, so I've got a browsing history. Microsoft Office, we've got some documents in the document history. We've got Flash, Java, stuff in the recycle bin as well. There's some instances of malware to check the recycle bin to see whether you're being virtualized or not. Um, and then other um, kind of basic sort of things, uh, set the hardware, hard drive size to be over 60 gig, any less than 60 gig, and it reckons it's been virtualized. But there are some parts of um, anti-virtualization techniques that we, we couldn't really get past. For example, VirtualBox, you have to use guest editions to try and control and manipulate um, files in and out. We couldn't get by, um, past that, really. So we, we tried as much as possible. But for us, we didn't go full hog and you try and do full and anti-virtualization, anti because the fact that malware would check for virtualization is an indicator of malware, and we wanted to use that as a feature. So we've got our host operating system, and essentially just launches a Python script, so the thing that I uh, clicked on there, and that launches my virtualized guest operating system. So it'll load a clean snapshot that's been um, previously saved. Uh, it loads a debugger, in this case I used Ollie debug, um, and it, um, as a pass the file that I want to investigate as a parameter, launches the file. Um, I run it for nine minutes. You could run it longer because some malware will wait or sleep for a while, wait to sleep for 24 hours. Some malware sleeps for 30 days before it then encrypts your hard drive. Um, run it for nine minutes. Um, and in the background, the debugger traces. So essentially, we get the assembly language instruction by instruction. One of the good things about dynamic analysis is that you get the instructions in sequence as they occur as they're passed to the processor, which is important for other, for some machine learning algorithms, for example, um, hidden Markov models, we sequence-based learning. So that we, once we get the run trace, we tear down the VM, launch the next file. Um, that was distributed then over um, 14 computers, and uh, we just let it run. So we have a dedicated malware lab for, for the MSC and cybersecurity. We just literally just let it run, let it go. Um, so at the end of the execution bit, we have the tracing part. So in the background of the execution, we've got a debugger running, just running tracer. So it literally just stores all the opcodes as they come. I parse through those um, with a, a parser that essentially just counts um, the, uh, all the instructions. This is the sort of trace that we get. Now, typical execution will be about 9 million lines long. Um, so it's a, a small snapshot. So what we look at are these, I discard everything else. These are the opcodes. I discard the operands because I'm not particularly interested in them. It's the sequence and the quantity of opcodes that we look at. So this is then incorporated into a large data set. So the database, essentially a CSV file, looks something like this. So the top line there, that would be one instance of malware. So the opcode XOR occur, occurs 10,622 times, call 11,000, et cetera. So essentially we're counting the opcodes as they occur. We do some manipulation of that for different data sets as well. For example, we can switch the frequency, so the percentage of time, percentage of opcodes in the entire one of that instance that are XOR. And also we have a parser that um, puts it into um, just the opcodes in sequence, translates them into a number, and that can pass the um, head Markov models depending on the toolbox that you use. So results date, this is actually slightly outdated because the system just runs eternally. I literally have a folder, drop malware into it, it just keeps going and going and going past me. The only problem is storage for the terabytes upon terabytes of run traces that we have. Um, so it's slightly more than this, but at the minute, um, 48,000 executed, processed, and labeled dynamic run traces of malware. In context and literature, the next largest that I found in my lit review, which is slightly old, the 6,700 dynamic or 22,000 static. The data set um, is hopefully going to be published, so we're just going to make it available to the wider research community so people can do whatever they want to. The counterpoint to the malware data set then is um, the benign. It's actually the hardest part to do. 
because it's harder to get um, benign software. Malware, it's kind of a sign of the times. It's harder to get legitimate software than it is to get malware. Malware is also an automated attack vector, whereas benign files, it's a bit more complicated to, uh, to actually execute them and, and get a decent trace of them. We got 1,200 benign files traced. We used then um, a synthetic uh, minority class oversampling technique called SMOTE. Uh, and essentially, we used that to triple the data set. We um, verified that by comparing um, classification rates, essentially. So we increased the classification by the amount that we added, synthetic samples that we added. So we're sitting on 3,600 um, benign samples. So the work in progress, so essentially the data set that was finished a few weeks ago. Um, and the work in progress that we're doing at the minute, so we're trying to redefine the malware labels based on supervised machine learning, so essentially clustering, blind uh, clustering of the dynamic run traces. We're clustering a subset of the data, as in the militia data set, which I'll talk about in a little second, which has the unusual benefit of two sets of labels. So one data set at the minute has two sets of labels. And then we're doing clustering with opcode analysis, so this will potentially overlap both, but we'll be able to see how they map up. So for the militia data set, there was 12,000 binaries. So in machine learning terms, it's fairly unusual to have data that can be labeled with two different sets of labels. So the militia authors um, labeled their data uh, using a wide variety of techniques, um, including they used the icon analysis, kind of let you know what um, kit it came from. They used um, kind of server analysis, IP landing addresses, um, known previous addresses. But also, we were able to put the militia binaries through 52 AV scanners using virus total. So we have two different sets of labels for the same data, but we wanted to add a third. So we took all these binaries and put them through the system, executed them, got the wrong traces. So we have um, a third set of labels that we can uh, run clustering on. So we've got the novel dynamic run trace clustering labels. So essentially, for the same data, we have three sets of labels. We're working on seeing how these overlap the R clustering of the run trace labels might kind of lean towards the AV scanner. It might lean towards the militia author's data themselves. It may be somewhere in the middle. Hopefully it's somewhere in the middle because then you're not measuring the exact same information. You've got something new. Um, we're working on improving classification. So that's benign versus malicious. So it's the ultimate thing that you want to do is designate something as malware or something as benign. So using basic classifiers, um, a linear uh, support vector machine, um, trees, K nearest neighbors, we got um, over 99% accuracy, 99.8% accuracy, so it can discriminate against um, benign software versus malicious software 99.98% of the time. We used some ensemble classifiers to see if we could um, tweak that a bit, some boosted trees, some subspace KNN, roughly the same amount with tenfold cross validation. Then with the size of the data set, we're able to use likes of deep learning neural networks. So we used a scaled conjugate gradient back propagation trained neural network. Um, and again, 99% accuracy. These solve different problems and used in different data types. Um, for example, the neural, neural network needs to train once. It takes a fair bit of time to train it, but you can add a sample, a new sample, within milliseconds. So um, they, all, they all solve different problems. The one bigger kind of issue is that it, sometimes these performed quite badly on the benign set, so a lot of false positives comparatively. So kind of work that we're kind of working towards is using likes of rule-based learning, um, where it kind of counts, it, um, one algorithm is the Ripper, um, which uses um, roughly 30 rules on this data set to count the opcodes and say if it's over a certain number of opcodes but under another one, it's possibly this. So we got a 92.4% F-score, so that's a kind of an aggregated way of looking at your rough machine learning model. So 92.4% um, accurate on the benign set, which is better than some of the others, 98.7% overall. Looking at reducing the long run length, my supervisor, Dr. Cain, um, one of his papers pre when he was doing a PhD was on run length, and we were able to detect malware um, within a thousand opcodes, quite a short space of time in terms of execution. Looking towards the future and a few PhDs after me, um, there's possibly going to be a hardware implementation of this, so we're trying to run, look at this at runtime, so on a, for example, a hypervisor um, context. We're looking at feature selection and extraction. So one of the big issues for machine learning is reducing the number of features that you have. Um, I used 610 opcodes from um, the Intel instruction set. 304 of those didn't occur in the data set, so we just it down to 300 instantly. Um, so, but there are other ways, um, standard techniques for reducing the number of features so you get more accurate and quicker detection. 
We're looking at uh, sequence-based sequence -based learning, so HMMs. Um, so essentially, you can look at the sequence, and if a sequence occurs, um, so if you were looking at it from a hardware implementation of this, you would see the sequence of opcodes occurring, and you could detect that as malware. Class resampling then to provide even training. So we do have a class imbalance with um, benign versus malicious. We're looking at resampling that to see, and I've taken an aggregate to see whether that provides uh, better learning. The one thing um, I'm currently looking at is clustering to improve intra malware classification. So malware versus malware. Get rid of the benign and look at can we tell the difference between malware versus other types of malware? So although the benign software can be accurately distinguished from malicious files at 99.98% accurate, intra class detection is poor, and that's based on AV scanner labels. So each AV scanner label of the 15 that we kind of uh, assigned, the detection between those was actually quite poor. So deep learning classifier was 27% accurate. You'd be better off taking its answer, flipping it over, and then you would get 73% accuracy. Random forest uh, gives 74% accuracy, and a support vector machine gives 62%. So it couldn't detect uh, very well the difference between uh, these types of malware. So we wanted to look at our hypothesis of the labels that don't sufficiently describe the output representation of the data. So they're fairly high level descriptive um, terms. They don't accurately represent or map down to what actually happens on an instruction per instruction level. Um, so why do we want to know this? Um, essentially, it's threat analysis. So different types of malware pose different threats. If you've got um, a nasty bit of ransomware sitting on your system, you're going to take a different method of action uh, um, than if you've got a little kind of pop-up or a, a browser modifier. Um, so for our clustering, so we have 15 labels, so 15 different types of malware that we've signed these labels to on our database. And what we did was put them through the random, random forest classifier. I've mentioned this, so we got 74% accuracy. So uh, seven and a half times out of 10, it could tell the difference between different types of malware. So what I did was throw away all the labels, do blind and um, unsupervised learning. And we applied various clustering algorithms and gave them new labels. So the new label will become cluster one, cluster two, et cetera. It's up to us then to kind of decide what does that actually mean. Put these then through the random force classifier just to kind of compare with um, the AV labels. And when we look at the results, so this is one, um, the EM clustering algorithm. So we look here, you have three possibilities. So when it was um, the class that it predicted, 95% of the um, one of you have also got this here, and then the other one is zero point three six. That's essentially where you graph um, three possibilities against false negatives. I used X mean clustering, um, which found four clusters um, and able to be classified well. Sorry, the, the last one found eight clusters with varying kind of degrees of success. So you see cluster two there, three positives, fifty six percent of the time, not great. X means clustering, found four clusters, and able to be classified well. However, two of the clusters were very small. For example, you'd have a cluster with 28,000 samples, and you have a cluster with 29 samples. Not a very good model. X means is just k-means clustering algorithm with a cost function, so essentially you penalize for a wrong decision. Um, and that can be used to determine optimal number of clusters. So you can that's, you can use that just as a, a lot of these algorithms will ask you how many clusters do you want. It's kind of counterintuitive when you're asking it for be unsupervised. You want it to tell you how many clusters, clusters there are. You can use X means to find the optimal number of clusters. So what I did was run X means and got these results. So you see cluster one there had 29 samples, 70% accurate. It's not a great model, even though the bottom line accuracy is fairly good. So we took the X-means, which supplied us four clusters, and we said the K-means clustering, give us four clusters back, see what you can do. And this is what we got here. So it separated it into four clusters for us, with a lot better spread, a lot better spread of uh, sample size as well. So you see the average true positive, so it can tell the difference between classes correctly 98% of the time. It's got decent other metrics, so one of the one main things we look at is ROC, the receiver operating characteristic curve which was 100% accurate. So essentially, when you map or graph true positives against false negatives, it's 100%. So at the bottom there, it's kind of essentially the takeaway message is that when malware is relabeled using dynamic opcodes, the clusters can be distinguished more accurately. So when you re throw away the labels and map to say, look at the information, say, separate yourself out, when you use opcode analysis, 
it's a lot more accurate to be able to distinguish these different types of malware. So that um, th these these are the original. So the bars are the original labels for that data set. So this would be like. But if you look at the cross sections with the different colors, this is the new cluster. So we see, for example, this has been mapped into four clusters. Cluster one, two, three, four, fourteen, and then you can see what the new cluster four. It shows that the, the new clusters have been spread across the entire um, uh, the entire range. So that's the kind of work that we're doing at the minute. Um, I'm still fairly early on, and I hopefully I'm only halfway through. I don't want to go past year four. Um, so if I go back over to my live demo, um, duplicate the screen. So um, hopefully you see at the bottom. So this is just kind of the, the trace that we went through. So it virtualized the malware. It then um, parsed it for all the opcodes, compared it um, against our machine learning database, and you'll see at the bottom here, sample one is malware. So it's detected this as malware. It is, it's a, it's a Trojan. Um, so that's just, that's just one model. We can take that model in and out, but it's essentially an end-to-end -end version of the system that we use to build the database. Um, that is... Me? So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so the question there was, uh, how do we know the malware started to work? Um, I only look at the malware itself and the execution, but there are other researchers who look at the traffic analysis. So we get a good run trace. Essentially, this is the malware actually working. Um, but we also look at the network traffic. So that's not my area of research, but other people do. Um, we filled uh, one night of executing 3,000 samples, we filled all the space that we could possibly store of PCAPs. So that's how we knew it was kind of working. Something was phoning home. Some of these, again, it's kind of, um, some of these malware samples can be a bit old in a few years. So the command and control servers might be down. So maybe trying to phone home, it may shut itself down. But again, this is, we're trying to model this from what a user would experience, particularly in a virtualized sense. So if somebody accidentally executes this program, this is what they would experience. Um, so we're trying to model it from a higher level, just like with the kind of virtualization um, and the hardening techniques. It's what somebody would actually experience. So if the malware is checking to see if it's been virtualized, that's the indicator that it's malware. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is, can uh, have I come across malware um, that can detect the debugger? Um, we use um, a masking tool um, called StrongOD to, to essentially mask that. Um, we're not going to be able to be 100% all the time for every instance of malware. Um, but we, we do use a masking tool because it is known that you can check whether that you're being virtualized and that you're being debugged, essentially. So I was able to test it on some legitimate software and some malware. If we get decent run traces, it means that the malware is running. It may be checking, but again, that's a, that's a feature for us to detect. Um, so I missed the question, but you're just saying so that um, Lex and McAfee that are. Sorry, I missed that. A few of them. So I, I work with CSIT, so a lot of the member companies are, for example, McAfee or Intel Security now. Um, they offer that sort of thing. Um, I've seen a few of them. Um, 
what I would love to do is have um, essentially just a machine that I can not virtualize and just run malware on and then scrap it and do it again. With dynamic analysis, it takes a long time. If you're processing 40,000 samples, it takes a long time. That's why um, in the literature, the sample sizes tend to be very small. The first paper in this body of literature was 70 samples. You can't really do malware analysis with 70 samples. Thank you very much.